The Language of Feelings, by David Viscott. Chapter 5, Guilt Guilt is the feeling of being unworthy, bad, evil, remorseful, self-blaming, self-hating. Guilt is the result of holding anger in so long that it turns against you. Guilt is a complicated feeling, and just as people are hurt by different acts they also feel guilty in different ways. People who feel guilty punish other people by their presence alone. They tend to reinforce the negative side of the world and ignore the positive. They are joyless. They don't feel worthy to accept what others give and so they don't feel fulfilled themselves and can't give back. Although guilty people may not be able to feel or admit to their anger, there is an angry quality to their outlook that makes other people feel rejected and drained. They seem to wallow in their negative feelings as a way of punishing themselves. Since most of us feel guilty about something in our lives, the guilt-ridden person also reminds us of unpleasant feelings we'd prefer to forget. Guilty people invite rejection and hurt by refusing offers of help and friendship. It's as if they feel better when other people treat them badly. Like the angry person, the person who suffers from guilt has a hard time directing his feelings toward the source of his long-held anger. He lashes out indiscriminately, and finds himself in a position difficult to defend. Imagine how foolish, unlovable, and unworthy such a person feels when he kicks the family cat, screams at his children or slams the door on a total stranger to relieve his frustrations. The resulting guilt comes not only from realizing that his reaction has been inappropriate, but also unnecessarily hurtful. He feels as cruel as the person who originally injured him. He begins to doubt his worth and to turn his anger inward, reinforcing his feelings of guilt. As we've seen in the previous chapter, when anger is held inside, it festers and expands until it becomes a person's entire inner world. Unexpressed, it often takes the form of angry fantasies and dreams. Almost everyone has experienced this. Someone hurts you and circumstances, or your own reluctance, prevent you from telling him. You feel used and taken advantage of. In your mind's eye you see your tormentor and seethe with anger. While walking down the street you become so absorbed in your anger and in imaginary ways of getting even that you take the wrong turn. You begin to relieve the scenes of your injury, and in your imagination you retaliate with a vengeance. Perhaps you humiliate your victim in the presence of others and embarrass him by cruelly pointing out his faults. Or you imagine yourself making a phone call to a powerful friend whom you instruct to fire the person, or to dress him down for injuring you, you who are such an important friend of his powerful employer. Or it's early morning. Your tormentor is tied to a post. He refuses the blindfold. Good, you'll watch him eye to eye. You give the command to the firing squad, ready, aim. Revenge. If angry fantasies are allowed to grow as the hurt and its anger are kept in, they can lead to feelings of guilt. Soon you, who normally picture yourself as calm and reasonable, find yourself entertaining fantasies of physical violence and excruciating torture. The medieval Grand Inquisitors had nothing on you. Your imagination, prompted by the trapped anger, rivals the worst monster of the Late Late Show. Worse yet, you catch yourself smiling in the mirror. You're even enjoying it. What do you do in the face of this sinister revelation about yourself? Feel ashamed, become unglued, or just feel exhausted by it all. You might begin by realizing that the hurt just possibly wasn't intentional to begin with and you're making the situation worse than it really is. Sometimes this understanding is enough at least to begin to relieve the anger release you from the preoccupation, and save you the guilt. Sometimes it's not. The angry fantasies and the guilt they create may continue to feed on themselves. You may even forget the original hurt that started all this, and become preoccupied and unable to stop thinking about revenge. You also realize you are the one having these bad thoughts. The other fellow merely hurt you, but you're having in a hate world. You feel worse. Now you begin to suspect there's something wrong with you. Maybe you really deserve to be treated the way the other person treated you. 
maybe he saw the evil potential in you that you've so nicely demonstrated to yourself. You begin to feel so badly about yourself that thinking about the original hurt actually makes you feel better. A guilty person like you deserved what he got, right? Guilt like this can get a grip on a person and begin to direct energies inward as it begins to punish, often in illogical, uncontrolled ways. Memory selects only negative recollections. Evidence of former accomplishments and good deeds that would support a positive image are more difficult to find. We're so convinced we must be bad that we struggle even harder to cover our anger after all, we have no right to it. We become more closed, less communicative, more uncomfortable to be around, with so much energy going inward, we only drain those around us. So, severe guilt becomes a terrible trap. If the guilty person begins to express anger, he may feel he's only proving he's the evil person he secretly suspects he is. Guilty people often fear punishment for their anger, which they secretly believe they deserve. They may even act in a way that invites rejection or hurt because they actually feel relieved when they're punished. They seem addicted to unfulfilling jobs and punishing life situations. It's no wonder. The constant external torment at least spares them the burden of self-punishment. It is a tortured way to live. The way out of such guilt isn't easy. You need to look at the reasons you weren't able to express your anger in the first place. What were you afraid of? Were you unaware you were being hurt? Did you fear rejection by the person who hurt you? How did you get trapped into holding your anger inside? What did you fear would happen if you let it out? You need to understand something about what got you into trouble before you can go back and try to resolve it. The anger you convey has to be justified by the actual hurt itself, by reality, not by your fantasies. Misdirected anger, unfounded anger make you feel rotten and solve nothing, in fact make you feel worse. The most difficult kind of guilt to resolve is the guilt that's created not by a single incident but by a number of incidents over a long period of time. We become rigid in our pattern of behavior, hold back all hurts and deny all anger. We go through life guilt-ridden, blaming ourselves for everything that goes wrong. It's especially guilt-producing to be angry at someone you feel you're supposed to love. Children and parents, for example. An anxious mother or father may have mixed feelings about their child, might even occasionally secretly wish to be free of the responsibility of parenthood, of adulthood in general. But such parents often can't accept these awful feelings, instead feel guilty and direct their anger inward. To be angry at one's children, many of us have been taught, means to be a bad parent. And to be so angry that sometimes we wish they weren't there. Well, that's a capital offense. But the thought isn't father to the act, and it's acts, not thoughts or feelings that are subject to outside rational punishment. Actually we all feel angry at our children from time to time. Trouble comes when we're angry at our children and try to pretend we're not. That often makes for insincere compensatory displays of affection, born less from real affection than out of guilt. The children feel there's something wrong but are confused and naturally reluctant to show their true feelings. We parents have disguised our anger so well in our giving and our children are so hungry for it that they feel it's wrong even to think their wonderful parents are insincere. Their needs cause them to distort their perception. They need loving parents so they perceive their parents as loving. Almost. They're also pretty smart. All this makes for unhealthy orientation to the world for a young child who begins to let his needs shape his reality. And the overdose of giving makes growing up harder for the parent, who may now feel committed to supporting his image as a giving parent and so gives to support his own disguise not because he feels it and wants to. This parent may see the child as a stumbling block to his or her own growth and development. The real stumbling block, though, is the parent. Afraid to grow, he or she uses the child as an excuse. But covers it up. We should be in the business of uncovering. Parents like this often undermine any uncovering of anger by the children, especially at the parents. 
If your child says, I hate you, as children frequently do even over trivial matters, and if you're insecure about your own anger toward the child, you may say, don't ever say a thing like that. How dare you, you hurt my feelings. The child feels guilty and learns that letting out anger is bad, especially at parents. It's also unsafe, he may lose his parents' love. Better to shut up, like the bad little boy or girl he or she must be. And the very angry adult he or she is likely to become if this exchange becomes a pattern between parent and child. Now take it from the other viewpoint, feeling guilty and angry at your parents. We like to think of our parents as all giving people who will always take us in and accept us. Unfortunately our expectations of how our parents are or should be aren't always borne out by reality. Parents are simply people who happen to have children. Because they happen to have children doesn't automatically make them more responsible or even loving. It offers an opportunity and a challenge, but it doesn't necessarily build character. In fact for some people parenthood erodes what limited emotional reserves they have. Not everyone should be a parent, and not everyone who is a parent can be a good one. The resentment between reluctant parents and their children feeds on each other's disowned anger. Often the product of such a parent becomes an adult who can't deal with his anger. He harbors resentment at his parents, whom he sees as artificial and phony, acting in a giving manner but withholding what the person most needs, love and support. The anger that couldn't be voiced in childhood still seeks expression, and the scene is set for an emerging adult who feels guilty for continuing to harbor anger and resentment. He may even be afraid of doing anything that is strictly for himself, because he feels that in fulfilling his own desires and needs he's in some way voicing anti-parent feelings, which recall his old anger and evoke buried guilt. Breaking out of a pattern like this is difficult, but not nearly as difficult as continuing to live a guilt-ridden life. If you're forced to live in constant fear of hurting your parents' feelings, your life becomes a painful replay of your confused childhood. But confronting your parents face to face does run the risk of producing more bad feelings than it resolves, unless now as an adult you have dropped your defensive attitude and approach the problem in a calm, straightforward manner, not a confrontation nose to nose like little kids but a direct and honest exchange like adults. Be forewarned, though, parents who produce guilt in their children have a way of acting helpless and hurt when they get older. They can express such a sense of loneliness and isolation that the guilt aroused by a head-on confrontation can be overpowering for you. The best policy is to stop pretending to your parents that you don't feel what you do feel or that your feelings don't matter. If your parents have upset you or made you feel guilty simply point it out. If you tell your parents and all they can do is tell you how much you hurt them by telling them that, there's practically nothing you can do about that nobody's listening to you. If that's the case, if there's not even a willingness, or ability, to listen, then you've little to draw on, except your own capacity for self-punishment if you endlessly persist. What should you do to please such a parent? You'd better go about your business of living the best life you can and hope but not expect your parents will be happy for you. These are the terms to think in, if you're to break loose from the emotional chains that have kept you bound in guilt. Guilt-producing people, such as some parents, are always best dealt with by being perfectly honest and straightforward, though not by being provocative, as if restaging who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. Here's an example, a telephone conversation between a woman and her manipulative, guilt-producing mother. It's intended to illustrate that honesty helps to take away the burden of expressing anger and puts the problem back on the parent, where in this case it belongs. Mother, you never called me back. Daughter, I've been very busy. Bobby has a cold, Charlie's getting ready to deliver his talk at the California sales meeting and he's been pretty tense. Mother, well, I decided that it would be a good idea to go to Los Angeles with the two of you. I could come out after the meeting and we could spend the next two weeks together. The daughter, who has not included her mother in her vacation plans, is thinking of a dozen different ways to say this. She considers saying, Look, mother, 
we haven't made any definite plans yet and besides it may not be possible to get reservations. But she knows mother might question why and her flimsy excuses would instantly be suspect. She'd be accused of not wanting her mother around, not loving her. She'd then have to overreact to prove to her mother that she really still loved her and make an offer to get together with her if chances permitted. Of course her mother would then investigate the reservation situation in Los Angeles like a travel agent and call back within the hour to announce that she'd found reservations for the three of them. You cannot mess around with a mother like this. They act helpless to arouse pity, but become as inventive as one of Agatha Christie's sleuths if they suspect you're avoiding them. Or daughter tries a direct, truthful approach. Daughter. Charlie has told me he'd really prefer to be alone with me on our vacation after the meeting, that he works very hard and doesn't want anyone else around but me. That means no children, no mother-in-law, no work. Mother, oh. The truth has stopped her in her tracks for the moment. But I was planning on it. Besides I won't be any trouble. Your sister and brother-in-law invited me along on their vacation. Daughter. Being straightforward, honest, and also suspecting her sister is still quite sane and wouldn't do something like that, then why don't you go with them? Mother, well, it's not settled yet. Besides, I told them I'd probably be going with you and Charles. But if you don't want me to go. Daughter, well, you shouldn't have spoken before you knew our plans. It was important for the daughter not to wander from the truth. By telling the truth she forced her mother to react to the actual situation rather than to any possible defenses the daughter may have had. She didn't try to avoid her mother. Avoiding is an old game and her mother knew it well. The mother's only power over her daughter lay in the possibility of making the daughter he, catching her at it, and then in a show of hurt, create guilt in her daughter. By telling the truth, the daughter was dealing from her greatest strength. If she said something she hoped would be more acceptable to her motlier, she'd have trapped herself in her mother's game playing. She told the truth. If her mother couldn't stand the truth, it wasn't the daughter's fault, the guilt was off her shoulders. She would have to learn to accept her mother's feelings of rejection as the creation of her mother's personality and lifestyle and not feel guilty over them. Remember, you owe no one the obligation to he. You always owe yourself the truth. Your parents' expectations for you can also lead to guilt. Their plans for you may reflect their own unfulfilled goals rather than your potential or gifts. As a result you are encouraged to measure yourself against a standard your parents themselves couldn't meet. It was important for the daughter not to wander from the truth. By telling the truth she forced her mother to react to the actual situation rather than to any possible defenses the daughter may have had. She didn't try to avoid her mother. Avoiding is an old game and her mother knew it well. The mother's only power over her daughter lay in the possibility of making the daughter lie, catching her at it, and then in a show of hurt, create guilt in her daughter. By telling the truth, the daughter was dealing from her greatest strength. If she said something she hoped would be more acceptable to her motlier, she'd have trapped herself in her mother's game playing. She told the truth. If her mother couldn't stand the truth, it wasn't the daughter's fault, the guilt was off her shoulders. She would have to learn to accept her mother's feelings of rejection as the creation of her mother's personality and lifestyle and not feel guilty over them. Remember, you owe no one the obligation to lie. You always owe yourself the truth. Your parents' expectations for you can also lead to guilt. Their plans for you may reflect their own unfulfilled goals rather than your potential or gifts. As a result you are encouraged to measure yourself against a standard your parents themselves couldn't meet. So you're placed in the tough position of having to please your parents before pleasing yourself. If you're a child of such parents you may achieve great success in their eyes and still feel miserable about yourself because you don't know what success is in your own right. If you live for your parents, who will live for you your children? Thereby forms a vicious circle. 
it's hard enough to try to do your best at a difficult task without having to feel you're letting your parents down by pursuing, and achieving, your own goals. Remember, in the end only you can know what's best for you. When you don't act as you really believe and feel, you can't function at your highest level. To go against what you believe just to please someone else always turns out badly anyway. You can never adequately defend a cause or goal you don't believe in. There are subtle parental pressures that can bind you long after you've grown up and should know better. It makes you feel very guilty to become angry at parents who have made great personal sacrifices to send you to school or help you toward a career, even if they were also actually trying to live their life through you. However subtly hinted, parents' martyrdom doesn't go unnoticed. You feel obligated to make good your parents' sacrifices. My parents shall not have struggled and sacrificed in vain, say you, the noble, self-sacrificing, guilty-feeling child. There's another unhappy consequence even if you manage to fulfill the dreams of your parents, feeling uncomfortable all the way. At least, you may figure, you've not hurt them by going along, they'll now be proud and pleased that you are a doctor, dentist, pharmacist, plumber, garment worker, teacher, whatever. Not necessarily so, you may have done so well that your success is seen by your parent not as a fulfillment of his dreams but as a put-down of himself. To succeed in pleasing can be to succeed in displeasing as well. How do you feel then? How can you win in a situation like that? You can't. You can mostly feel anger, pain, and guilt. It's better to try being yourself. It's true, of course, and it's natural that when we're young we look for acceptance and understanding from our parents and tend to trust their advice and guidance above all others. And chances are your parents had the best of intentions about you, just as they did about themselves. But they're only people, only human, some wise, some not so wise. All tend to have the same problems and blind spots where their children are concerned, whatever the varying degree. All sincerely believe they have only their children's best interests at heart, but that does not make it so and it can make for an enormous burden on the child. Torn between finding himself and pleasing his parents, he has insufficient emotional support to pursue his own interests and insufficient talent to succeed in the areas his parents do encourage. He may never have the experience of performing at his best. Instead he feels defeated or worthless. Worst of all, he may feel unable to justify pursuing what he loves. By not developing what abilities he may have, he even begins to doubt these. He's unhappy, feels incompetent. He's also angry at his parents, whether he admits it or not, and if not, eventually feels guilt over his anger. To get out of a bind like this you've got to learn to believe in your feelings and accept yourself as you are. If your parents haven't yet accepted themselves, how can they ever accept you anyway? If they need to prove that they could have succeeded had circumstances only been different, then they need you to live that missed chance for them which, of course, won't work for them or you. In any case, the purpose of your life isn't to justify theirs. Becoming acceptable to yourself is enough of a responsibility, and it should be your first priority. What is your life worth if it's ruled by anything other than the search for the truth about yourself? Obviously, though, somewhere along the way it's not unlikely your parents will be hurt. But the truth is that their deep down hurt is not so much over you as it is over their failure to fulfill themselves. That realization often is a long time in coming. But by allowing yourself to support their unrealistic expectations of the world you have only at best delayed it and prolonged their unhappiness. It's foolish to lead your life to protect your parents from looking honestly at theirs. Maybe they don't want to, or can't. That's understandable. It's also true, nonetheless, that accepting each other as you are is the best and only realistic way. You will probably have to take the initiative. It's risky, it hurts, and you can be hurt. If you try it with them, approach with caution. But don't hold back living your own life. 
If you're afraid that acting in your own best interests will hurt others, that fear can inhibit you from acting at all. It's natural to feel anxious about risking the love of other people by acting in a way you're honestly convinced is in your best interests. There needn't always be a good for you, bad for them equation, but it's often the case, at least from the other person's viewpoint and it can be a considerable bind for you if you allow it to overwhelm you. Such binds can be excruciatingly painful for young children. Consider, for example, the child who continually is told by his parents something to the effect of. If you're good you'll act the way we want you to, and of course you're good because we wouldn't love you if you weren't. Instead of learning to judge right from wrong on the basis of his feelings and experience this unfortunate child is encouraged to suspend his feelings and judgment and accept his parents without question. Trouble comes when he wants to do something his parents won't approve of. If he goes ahead, he worries he may lose his parents' love. If he suppresses his own desires he undermines his ability to grow from his feelings and experiences. He gets caught in a bind and becomes confused and ambivalent about taking any action at all. To resolve ambivalent feelings, nothing is as helpful as a strong sense of oneself. Such a self-view doesn't form overnight, and no one's self-view is fixed. Everyone has the capacity for growth and for redefining himself by an honest encounter with reality. If you don't avoid ambivalent issues but meet them directly and try to solve them, they will become fewer and fewer. The questions on which most ambivalence is based are universal, am I good or bad? Weak or strong? Smart or stupid? Independent or dependent? Free or controlled? If you're uncertain about the answers to these questions, you'll feel ambivalent whenever they confront you. Because people are afraid that in facing the truth about themselves they may find themselves lacking, they tend to avoid such basic either-or questions. Facing them is the first and often most important step in solving them, and accepting the answers, however difficult, is the best way to decrease the unease of ambivalence. What is it you want for yourself in this life? What are you doing to get it? What is in your way? Who put it there? Why have you waited for a crisis to force you to act? These are the larger questions that follow the first ones. Again, by facing them you begin to help free yourself from the paralysis of ambivalence. The questions beg for the answer, decide who you are, what is best for you. There is, of course, an important balance to be found between allowing others to run your life and acting without concern for anyone but yourself. This chapter is not an invitation to do whatever you want to avoid guilt. The modifying considerations, as always, involve treating others with mutuality and compassion, learning to love and respect yourself and your potential, nurturing yourself as a precious gift, and treating other people in the same way. Don't allow other people to use you or coerce you into denying your feelings out of fear of hurting them. But be certain you don't run over them in the process. Your freedom from guilt doesn't depend on their abuse. The most common sort of guilt comes from realizing you've done something truly hurtful to another person. To deny responsibility for that hurt only reinforces your sense of guilt. The best way to relieve yourself of such guilt is to accept the blame for your actions, to apologize and to repair the damage you've done. This has a remarkable way of easing inner tension and making all parties feel better. All of us feel guilty at times. Our guilt becomes a problem only when we don't understand it. We've seen that most guilt results from anger that hasn't been sufficiently expressed. If you feel guilty, find out where your anger is coming from. Understand how you were hurt. Make appropriate amends if you've hurt someone. If you feel guilty because you've let someone down, reconsider according to whose best interest you were acting in and by whose lights you let someone down. At least look at the situation just possibly you may not have been entirely at fault. Possibly you've not been at fault at all. People who make you feel guilty often use being hurt as a weapon. Producing guilt in others is a powerful and cruel device, it causes feelings to go underground, clouds up the issues that caused the original anger. 
It's very difficult to settle conflicts with another person when you are led to argue from your weakest, most defensive position. When someone plays on your guilt they draw out a less mature, more defensive person from inside you. The guilt brings out the childish part of you, the person who is most afraid of being punished and most fears being unlovable. It is also the part of you that eventually, if the person keeps it up, may be tempted to strike back in kind, which then evokes the same response in the other person. You hurt me, I hurt you. Eventually both of you become guilt-ridden, and no anger gets resolved. The only thing to do in a situation like this is to be clear about your feelings and to state them clearly. Point out that you believe the other person is using his guilt to hurt you and that no matter how much hurt you might have caused it does not justify retaliation by overkill in a guilt-producing way. One of you has to take the responsibility for setting limits. The person who is healthier, who has the best understanding of his feelings, should say enough is enough, and stop. It takes two to argue. Hopefully that healthier party will be you. Even so, after all the good and right and healthy things are said and done, most of us will continue to feel some guilt when we get angry at those we feel we're supposed to love. I hope it's clear by now that we've got to express our anger and hurt regardless of who hurt us. The proper expression of hurt redirects negative feelings outside of ourselves and is vital to restoring our emotional balance. It's true that expressing your anger may sometimes be perceived as hurtful by others, but you can't afford to take on their burdens, not at the expense of your own life. Your ultimate goal in life is to become your best self. Your immediate goal is to get on the path that will lead you there. Why should you feel guilty if you refuse to be intimidated by a person who persists in standing in the way of your being that best self or who is hurt when you finally manage it? You will never really please such a person, even if you diminish yourself forever. If your healthy growth is viewed as a hurt by someone that will have to be their problem. The highest love a person can have for you is to wish for you to evolve into the best person you can be. No one owns you, no matter what your relationship. You are not here on this earth to fulfill the unmet dreams of a frustrated parent or to protect another person from facing the reality of himself or the world. You are here to develop and grow, to do your share to make the outside world a better place to live, to make the immediate world you live in, the world that is you, as honest and as true to your feelings as you possibly can. Of course compromises must be made with resources of money and time, but hopefully your life goal won't substantially change or be deviated from. If that happens, your life, no matter how hard you try, will only be an excuse for the truth of what you are, your contribution to your loved ones will be limited by that lack of truth, and you will be on the embittering road to deep anger and its partner in the killing of your dream guilt. It needn't happen. Don't let it.